just making sure everything is connected and working right. It looks like we might be good this time around. Um, I am on headphones with a built-in mic. It's right here um, because my kids are in the next room watching a movie. And I'm hoping that the built-in mic and the headphones will keep you from hearing their really epic movie with lots of explosions and fighting dragons and things. Um, it's summer vacation. What are you going to do? Um, if you get onto this video, hey, Autumn, and you can't hear me, please let me know. I have had a few problems with the microphone in the past, but otherwise we're here. We're ready, right? Okay. Um, also, last time we did one of these live chats. Hey, Trudy. We, uh, we noticed that, well, I didn't notice until it was too late, but some of the questions didn't come through immediately. So if I don't answer your question right away, try sending it one more time. Um, if you have questions, uh, this is exciting. Um, so today we're going to be talking about my latest release. It's what won in the poll that I took in my reader group. Um, and it came out just last week. Is that when it came out? When did it come out? Yeah, it came out last week on May 23rd. And Rescuing Lord Inglewood is the title. Isn't that pretty? I think it's my favorite cover so far. I absolutely love just how beautiful this is. And my cover designer did an awesome job. This model before was standing just out in the field with a big blue sky behind her, nothing else going on. So my cover designer actually made the entire background from a few different pictures so it would work. I love every detail of this from the beautiful velvety look of her jacket um, to the beautiful gray skies. Do you see all the gray? The weather plays an interesting part in this book and in the rest of the books in this series. So pay attention to the weather sometimes when you're reading. It's always interesting how the weather kind of sets the mood and sets the scene. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of questions submitted ahead of time. I think I almost got none. Uh, but there are a few things that I can begin talking about. So if you have anything you want to know as we go, just you know, shoot the question. Um, so Rescuing Lord Inglewood is the first book in my new series. And the series is just called Inglewood. Short, sweet, simple, easy to remember, I hope. Um, and it's called that because the series follows um, five friends who grew up together playing every summer in this beautiful estate. Uh, this on this beautiful state called Inglewood. So um, they mention, you know, their childhood quite a lot in the book, and uh, they have some interaction um, on site sometimes. Um, so I just thought it would be an appropriate, appropriate name for them. Um, so the series is about um, three boys and two girls who were all really close in age, and they grew up um, in the same area. This little corner of Suffolk, Suffolk, I can't say it the way British people say it, I'm sorry, um, but they spent most of their childhoods together, and they would go out and play, you know, in, in the forest, and they would go out and play on the beaches, and in the house, and they just spent all of their time um, in this little club that they formed, uh, just interacting with the, with the world around them, excuse me, um, my phone just went off, that scared me, um, so there's, uh, let's see, the, the, these kids are um, Silas, and he is the Earl of Inglewood. And then there's Jacob. He uh, is actually going to be in my next book. Um, but he grows up, and he wants to be a vicar, so a priest. Um, and then there is uh, Isaac, Sir Isaac. He's a baronet. And then um, two sisters. They're twins, and their names are Hope and Grace. And Grace is going to be in the next book. She's the heroine in the next one. Uh, they were so much fun to get to know and to write about and to interact with. Um, all in my head, of course, <laughs> as I got to know them and just got to see the dynamics that they had with each other and how you could have, you know, a group of people who grew up together and yet they go off and do such different, different things. Um, that happens a lot when you have long-term friendships. 
Now, personally, I didn't grow up with a core group of friends. We moved around a lot when I was around that age where that kind of fun would happen. Um, but I did grow up with a lot of cousins and we saw each other every summer. And then, of course, we've seen each other quite a bit as adults, too. You know, after we've all grown up and gone to school or gotten married, um, we get back together every few years and catch up. So that was kind of the inspiration behind the idea of taking a group of kids and then jumping forward and following them as they find love. So um, let's see. Um, trying to think of things that people have asked me. I've gotten quite a few email questions uh, for people who are on the newsletter or who follow me on BookBub and things like that. Not people who are going to be watching the video today, but some of the questions have been fun. Uh, I was asked, besides what was my inspiration, you know, to write this group of kids, my cousins, if you missed that. Um, I've been asked, you know, why do I make heroines who find themselves in such difficult places? Um, because it would be a boring book if I didn't put them in bad situations to begin with, right? I mean, if you have somebody who has the perfect life and who's happy and doesn't really pay much attention to what's going on around her and everything's good, you're not gonna have this compelling a story. So that's why I take my heroines and I stick them in uncomfortable situations. One of the inspirations for rescuing Lord Inglewood for that opening scene where my hero and heroine interact for the first time um, was actually a scene from the BBC version of North and South. And I love that movie. It's like a little mini series, but I just, I just watched the whole thing all at once. Um, but if you've seen North and South, and if you haven't, you should, if you've seen it, there's a pivotal scene where the heroine jumps in front of the hero to save him from being injured. And in doing so, she's injured herself. And um, then everybody who sees the event and knows about it is like, oh, oh no, you know, she's compromised herself now and she's going to have to marry him. And he needs to do the honorable thing because everybody can tell that she's really into him. I mean, she just put it all out there when she saved him. Um, not thinking that, you know, it's a spur of the moment thing that this beautiful woman did for this man that she would maybe have done for anybody. And so watching that scene and thinking about it and then thinking about how easy it was for a woman to compromise herself in the early 1800s, I decided I was going to do it. I decided I was going to take a woman and a man, and I was going to throw them together in an intense moment, and then everybody around them would kind of be forcing them to get together. Um, for those who might not be familiar with the term, when a woman was compromised uh, back in the Regency era and the Victorian era, what that would mean is she put herself or she was put in a situation that was so inappropriate that the only way to save her reputation would be for her to marry the person that she was in the situation with. So in this case, and I don't feel like it's too much of a spoiler because I did put this first chapter um, at the end of my last book. <coughs> Excuse me, it's dry throat. Um, but the situation that I put these two in is, um, my hero is walking down the street completely oblivious to everything and he almost gets killed by something falling from above and she sees it in time. Um, her name is Esther. I guess I should start calling them by their names. So, so Silas is walking along. He doesn't see what's about to fall on him. Um, Esther sees it and there's a crowd, you know, because it's a busy day outside in London and Esther jumps um, to, into action and she saves him. But in order to do that, she like shoves him out of the way and then they stumble and fall and she's on top of him and unconscious. Oh, <gasps> scandalous for several moments. And, um, you know, everybody sees this and there are gossips and they're like, oh, look at her. She just threw herself at him and oh, she's still on top of him. And oh, this is so inappropriate. Whereas in modern day, we probably wouldn't think that was a big deal. We'd all just probably be giving her a round of applause for, for saving this guy's life. But back then, everybody kind of gasped. Oh, thanks, Felicia. Felicia says I look lovely. Um, <laughs> um, so she's in this compromising position. And in my story, that isn't really, that's the catalyst that gets things moving, but it's not what really pushes them over the edge and to the point where they have to get married. Um, for people who have not read this, there are probably going to be spoilers. I'm just going to warn you now, because how can you talk about a book without talking about some of the cool themes? Um, Later in the story, like they're trying to get past this thing, they're trying to like 
play down the whole event so that they don't have to marry each other. Um, but later in the story, they are in another situation where my heroine just kind of flies off the handle a little bit. She is just sick and tired of everybody telling her what she can and can't do. Pretty normal back back then. Um, girls had to do whatever their male relative or guardian told them to do. No choices, no anything. So um, Silas tells her one time too many not to do something silly. And it's walking across this old mossy log on a, you know, to get across the stream. And she's really mad. She's never been able to walk across that log. She used to follow this group of friends that I told you about around. She wasn't old enough to hang out with them, um, but she desperately wanted to. So she'd follow them around and um, she was never allowed to cross this log as a kid. And she says, you know what? I'm tired of people telling me I can't do this, so I'm going to do it. And of course, she's going to stumble and fall and get really soaking wet. And he's the only one there to help her. So, you know, that's the second situation that they find themselves in that is very damaging to somebody's reputation. Here you have this soaking wet woman all alone with this man, and they have to walk back to where they can get her help at that point. So just bad situation for them. So sorry, but not really because it made for a great story. So that is kind of the beginning and how my characters find themselves in the situation where they have to get married. Now, the marriage of convenience trope is one of my favorites. And I may have talked about this a little bit before, but the reason I love it so much is because there were so many limitations on men and women spending time together in the early 1800s in England, um, especially if they were above working class. You just couldn't be alone with a man. You couldn't be in a closed room with him. You couldn't um, go on a, you know, be in a closed carriage with him. If you were going on a carriage ride, it had to be open. That way everyone could see that you two weren't up to anything, you know, just that you shouldn't be doing. Um, and society was just very strict. If you were lucky, uh, you got to go on walks through maybe a garden with the guy you loved or the guy you were hoping you would fall in love with. And, you know, people were probably watching you from the windows. A lot of the times you would be followed around by a maid. You know, she would make sure that she was there to keep an eye on you so that nothing happened. Um, if you went riding, then there would probably be a groom who would be on his own horse following along behind you. There were not private moments. When you would go to these elegant balls that we've all seen in these wonderful Jane Austen adaptations, um, the dances were long. They were, you know, they, you could dance for 15, 20, sometimes to 30 minutes, just one dance. And most of the time, you agreed to dance a set. Okay, a set is actually two dances back to back. So you would have, you know, all of this time. Great, I can talk to this guy all this time and can dance with him for, you know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. No, I'm sorry, you don't get to talk to him very much. Um, during the Regency time period, when you dance, those beautiful, elegant dances that we, we've watched and enjoyed, most of the time, you were moving from one partner to the other. You know, you would Sure, step forward and smile and maybe say something to the man you were interested in, the man who had actually asked you to dance. But then you would step back and you would be, you know, several feet away from each other. And then you would kind of like loop in and out with the other couples. There was no alone time. So it's really hard for me, at least, to write a Regency era romance where my couple isn't already forced to somehow be together. And in Rescuing Lord Inglewood, the marriage of convenience. I forced them to get married so that they can have time to actually get to know each other. Um, sounds really backwards to people with modern sensibilities. Hey, Victoria, howdy. So that is uh, why I chose the marriage of convenience trope. I wanted to stick these two together and make them have conversations and not limit myself by having to have a chaperone available all the time. So that's that. Um, what else? Does anybody have anything they want to know about? Any scenes you'd like to, to know more about why I wrote them the way I did? Ask questions. I don't see any questions yet. Lots of highs and hellos, and Autumn has been so compromised. <laughs> um, hey, thanks. I love all of that. That's great. Um, oh, I lost my mouse. I'm trying to get my mouse. See if I can open up something else. Nope. Nope. I think my mouse died. I think my mouse just died on me. And that could be awkward here in a minute. Um, it did. It just died on me. <laughs> Great. 
Um, I love reading Regency. It's my favorite to read, but I can't imagine actually living in. You know what? Neither can I. They had a lot of great and beautiful, fun things going on, but it was also a really hard time. I mean, if you think about it, uh, especially the Jane Austen books that we love and adore so much, they had just come out of a really horrific war um, with France, and they were still doing battle in different places in the ocean because this was right before um, Great Britain really started working on colonizing most of the known world. You know, they had their, this is a dead mouse, they had their, um, They had to branch out their kingdom, and this was just right before that started happening. And one of the reasons, there it is, okay. One of the reasons that they started colonizing so many places was because they suddenly had the surplus group of soldiers after the battle with Napoleon, and they didn't have much to do with them. And it actually sent them into something of a recession for a time. So when Austin was writing a lot of her books, um, the country was experiencing like this really sad time period where the weather was just bad, so they didn't have great crops. They had all these soldiers coming home from war and no place for them to go, no place for them to work or be. Um, so it's, it was a difficult time period. They did have indoor toilets, though, at this point. I have seen many people say they wouldn't want to go back in time because they wouldn't have a toilet. They did have indoor toilets by the early, by the same time period that I'm writing in. So we would be okay with the toilets, guys. Toilet paper, not so much, but the toilets would be good. Um, Thanks, Trudy. It's been so much fun to write it. Um, Trudy says she's looking forward to the next book. I am too. I just sent it to my editor Friday morning, and I finished going through it myself. I finished writing it Tuesday, and I finished going through it myself on Thursday. And it was, it was a little bit crazy at my house for a little while while Mommy took the time to finish writing her book. Um, so rescuing Lord Inglewood. What else happens in this book? Um, the setting I chose for this book is uh, based on a real place. Unfortunately, the real house and everything I based everything on wasn't built until like the late 1800s, but that's okay. It's historical fiction. We fudge things. So there's this beautiful place, though, that I learned all about that's in this little corner of Suffolk right on the beach, and this enormous mansion with two weird tower things. I mean, it looks like somebody took about three different houses and stuffed them together. It's beautiful. I'll post a link. Um, to this place when I'm done. Um, but it was just a beautiful piece of land and it's right there and the beach is, you can see the beach from the top of the house and I thought this would be perfect. I wanna write a beach romance, you know, you see those all summer long. Um, these gorgeous covers with people, you know, big blue seas behind them and stuff. It's like, I wanna write a beach romance for the Regency and that's what I did. So there's a lot of talking about walking along the beach and the storms coming in and the salty air. And it's just, just such a lovely, setting. And I hope you kind of get that feel while, while you're reading the book. Um, if not, turn on, turn on some wave sounds while you're, while you're reading. That should help. I actually listened to a lot of beach sounds while I was writing just to kind of help me get into that mood. Um, so pretty exciting stuff. Um, yeah, but the setting is always important to me in a story. I want to make sure that I'm true to the setting, that I have the right kind of landscape, the right kind of trees, the right kind of feeling. Because if I know, you know what it feels like to be in this place, if I can do that research, um, it comes through in my writing. And it's usually not even on purpose. You know, If you have all these details in your brain about a specific location or time period as you're writing, they just tend to come out in odd places that you, you know, don't really realize until after. And writing about a beach in England. It's so much fun. Um, what else can I tell you? So this book, a lot of people on the Facebook group have been saying that they cried buckets and buckets of tears. And I'm kind of sorry for that, but not really, because that means that means the writing is, is where it needs to be for the story. Um, there is a very sad, dark moment, and it carries through and overshadows um, a few chapters of this book. Um, so I'm sorry that you had to slog through it, but hopefully when you had that dark thing resolved, I don't know how much I want to say without spoiling the book. Um, I hope when you realize that that dark moment had been resolved, that it was, it was a happy time and a good feeling. Um, somebody asked me why I include so many different scenes in my books where people go through this like mourning, um, 
these morning moments. Um, it's especially noticeable in my books, um, The Gentleman Physician and The Earl and His Lady, uh, where you actually have a death of a character and you actually have somebody in the other book who's mourning the loss of a spouse. And those are hard to write and I know that they can be hard to read. Um, but loss is something that we all experience in our lives. Um, maybe you haven't yet, uh, but you will. And I have a few times. I'm relatively young, but I've lost people that are really close to me. And those dark moments, um, sometimes I don't think, especially in our day-to-day, -day, we really take the time to sit and process what we're feeling or we're trying so hard to get over it or to be happy anyway or you know, to, you know, to find the reasons to keep going on. Um, so in books, and I found this true, especially for me in um, books, we have an opportunity to explore that emotion, uh, but it's set a little bit back from us. It's not us mourning, it's the character. And so we let ourselves kind of have that cathartic experience, just crying a little bit. Um, so sorry, sorry, not sorry, but I made people cry with that dark moment. Um, but it's really important to me to explore these major emotions that people have. Love stories should be uplifting and happy and they should have fun moments. And I think all of mine have that. But I also just wanna make sure that I'm touching on other aspects of life, not just the beautiful romance that we all love and that we all want, um, but just different, different feelings you know, that everybody's gonna experience. All right, I think I've got, does anybody have any questions? I'm looking to see if I've got any on Facebook yet. Facebook's being difficult. <laughs> nope, nothing yet. Um, I don't know, it's awfully hard to think of. Oh, here we go, here's the question. See, they're not coming up on my video screen, but they're coming up over here. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Trudy. Trudy had thunderstorms and had to go. Um, do we get to see Neil again in future stories? When Silas told him off, that was my most favorite part. That's a good question, Felicia. <laughs> yes, you will see Lord Neil again in future. Um, and I'm actually really excited to write about him some more. He is going to come and go a little bit. He's a little bit older than this group of friends that I was talking about, um, but he was always kind of around in the background, and he's somebody who was never really included, mostly because they thought he was a snot. But I, I am going to tell you guys, I actually like Lord Neal a little bit because I know his backstory. I know why he is the way he is. So I have some sympathy for him. Yes, he's going to crop up in more stories. Um, probably not going to come anywhere near Silas's land though, because if you have read that far in the book at this point, you know that Silas was pretty serious when he told Lord Neil to leave and never come back. Um, those are fighting words back in the day, by the way. And if Neil does come back, then he could be challenged to a duel, just saying. So it wouldn't be very smart of him to show up on that land in particular again. But he is an active member of that community, and he does show up in the next book. So um, I had somebody tell me that they really hated him, that <laughs> they hope that awful things happen to him in future. Um, I realize that I may have set y'all up to believe that that's what I do to my villains, especially given what I did to the one in the last series. But I can't do that to everybody, guys. I mean, it's fiction, but we don't want to kill them. <laughs> we don't want to end all of them. Yay, Felicia likes them too. This is so weird. They're not getting all these comments where I'm supposed to be getting them. Hmm. Any other questions? There doesn't have to be. This can be as short or as long as we want to make it, right? My kids are all distracted and my little one's asleep. So, <laughs> um, how about I tell you guys a little bit about the next book without giving anything away? I can do that if nobody has questions about this one right now. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want you to know about rescuing Lord Englewood. It was so much fun to write. It was so much fun. And I named a lot of the side characters after friends and family members. So that was fun too. Um, 
I really liked doing that. And I used a new program to format everything. So the inside looks really pretty. I don't know if you can see this, but isn't that pretty? I like the little, little symbols that I've got all through the book. Um, this book takes place at the very end of the war with Napoleon, you know, before they shipped him off the first time to um, Alba, that little island where he was stuck for a long time. Um, so the war is coming to an end in this book, and people are pretty happy about that. So there's this air of hope. And again, as I said before, it's right before a lot of bad stuff happens in England. So it was kind of this like golden season for a lot of them. Everybody was really happy. Everybody was buying gowns and partying, and things were great for about a year and a half, two years. And then things kind of went downhill again. Um, so let's talk about um, the next book a little bit. I don't have anything fun to hold up for that one because it's not in existence yet. Um, but it's called Discovering Grace. And it follows Grace Everly, who you meet in Rescuing Lord Inglewood. And it follows um, Jacob Barnes, the young man who is going to be a vicar. And it's a really fun story. It's the whole mistaken identity and switching places type of story. Grace and Hope are twin sisters. And they come upon a, a difficult situation where they're both going to be punished for something that um, me personally, I don't think they should have been punished for. But um, they're about to face the consequences of a poor decision. And the consequences are going to send Grace, who is really kind of a homebody, um, away and keep Hope, who longs for adventure in the great wide somewhere, very much like Belle. They're going to keep Hope at home. And neither of the sisters are happy about that. And so Grace, who is usually the one who follows all the rules and does what she's told without complaining, um, comes up with the idea that they need to switch places. So they do. And um, this book follows Grace as she's trying so hard to pretend to be her sister and not get caught, um, you know, until she absolutely has to reveal it. So, yeah, the almost vicar, yes. Um, Jacob, um, I don't know, if you paid attention to them a little bit in Rescuing Lord Inglewood, Jacob kind of has a crush on Hope. And he hasn't done anything about it or said anything about it, but it's there. And all the while, he's looking at, you know, hope and thinking about her. And she's the twin that wants to go off and have adventure. And the quieter twin, you know, Grace, is looking at him, having similar feelings, you know, wishing he would pay attention to her and wondering what she would need to do to kind of gain his interest in that way. So um, by the end of the next book, Jacob will be a vicar. That's fun. I got to research a whole bunch about the ordination ceremonies in England, and I didn't actually get to use a lot of it in the book. But I know a whole bunch about how it goes um, and where he would need to go to get that done and things now. Um, I tell you what, we research authors. We research so much. I mean, I could easily fill a bookcase with the amount of stuff I read for one book, and then you guys just get bits and pieces of it in the book. So if you ever have questions about things that are going on in the book or in the background or the history of the place, you know, feel free to ask those questions too, because I would love to just share that knowledge at least a little bit. So that's the next book. The third book in the series um, is called Saving Miss Everly, and it's going to follow Hope, you know, so they've switched places and she's the one who gets to go off and do this adventurous thing. And it's not all it's cracked up to be, of course, because that's life. But the third book is going to follow Hope and her romance, which is with somebody who you haven't met yet. I just need to get that out there because I've had several people tell me that they think Hope is going to end up with um, Sir Isaac. I'm sorry, she's not. I'm going to tell you that now so you won't be disappointed. Um, but I've got somebody else in mind for um, Hope. Really excited for that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have anything else to say today. This is a lot of fun, though, to talk about my book. I always enjoy talking about books. So that's it. And for those of you who are here live, let's see. How many people do we want to have? We had people come and go a few times. Um, I am going to put your names in one of those random name pickers. And I will be giving somebody their very own signed copy of Rescuing Lord Inglewood. Yay! 
So um, you'll have that. And then if you already own a paperback copy, then you can give that copy to friends and keep the signed one for yourself. Um, so here it is, one more time. I'm gonna sign it and I will be messaging y'all to let you know who gets the book. So I hope everyone has a great Saturday and I will be seeing y'all and talking to y'all later. Bye.